Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Jennifer Reynolds and I run the Lupus Clinic at the Mary Pack Arthritis Center. I'm really pleased to be speaking to you at the virtual symposium for 2021, though I miss seeing you all in person. This year I'm speaking about new treatments for lupus, which I think is quite exciting. I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview for my talk. I'm going to start by talking about the current lupus treatments that we use focusing on the medications that are available right now. I'm not going to speak about other treatments, but don't want that to mean that they're not important. So things like sleep, sunscreen, and exercise really are important for managing your disease. I'm going to speak about a couple of new treatments for lupus nephritis that have been approved recently, and that's when lupus affects the kidneys particularly. I'm also going to speak about another treatment option for lupus generally. There's many other medications that are coming through at various stages of development, and I'll touch on a few of those that are exciting, but for most, we want to wait and see how they do uh, through further study. So lupus disease activity is hugely variable. We know that some patients have severe disease and some patients have mild disease. Some patients have disease that's very easily controlled, and others, it's much harder for us to get the flares under control and to prevent future flares. Some patients will have disease that's limited to just their skin, whereas others will have multiple organs or tissues affected. And some patients will have disease that starts in childhood, while others it starts later. And some patients have many flares, while others occasionally will only have even just one. About 70% of patients tend to have a relapsing and remitting course. And we know that some variations in the dis different patterns of lupus that we see are related to different immune pathways. We can see that in research studies and in animal models, but we don't usually have good tools to measure uh, individual immune pathways clinically, and hopefully that's something that's going to change in the near future. In terms of lupus treatments, our treatment goals are to treat flares quickly and effectively. We know that faster identification of areas of disease activity can lead to earlier treatment and less scarring or damage. We want to minimize medication side effects, and some of this is through monitoring blood work, but also things like regular eye exams for hydroxychloroquine, bone density testing for patients who are on steroids, and reducing doses whenever possible, especially when using prednisone. We do use maintenance therapy to prevent flares in the future, and that generally includes hydroxychloroquine for most patients, unless there's a toxicity Sometimes we also need to use longer-term immunosuppressive therapies, like mycophenolate or imuran, particularly if patients keep flaring every time we try and taper medications. We tend to use treatments targeted towards the severity of the symptoms. So for milder disease with just aches or pains in the joints but no inflammation, some patients get away with using just ibuprofen or naproxen as needed. We will typically use hydroxychloroquine for mild disease and carry that through for both moderate and severe disease as well. And then we will use lower doses of steroids, either orally as by pills or topically in a cream, particularly effective when lupus affects the skin. Moderate disease is disease that's affecting more areas or is more severe in an area. And typically we would need to use a stronger immunosuppressive medication for these. Methotrexate is really effective for joint disease, and imuran or azathioprine is used for many different disease manifestations. Unfortunately, we also do need to use steroids frequently, and we tend to use a little bit higher doses if there's more severe disease. Severe disease in general is classified for, as disease that affects major organs, particularly the kidneys, and we'll talk about that in subsequent slides, but that also can affect the brain or other organs. And for this type of disease, we would use stronger immunosuppression like mycophenolate, malfetil, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, and bilimumab or bilista. We'll also frequently need to use high-dose steroids because they work so quickly, but we try not to leave patients on those high doses for very long. This is a figure that I've stolen from one of the guideline articles that's published for physicians that help to manage lupus patients. And you can see it's pretty close to what I was talking about earlier. This is non-renal or non-kidney lupus, and they divide it up to mild, moderate, and severe disease. Hydroxychloroquine is in green and is recommended across all of those for every patient. With glucocorticoids either orally or intramuscularly, for mild disease, and then higher doses orally or sometimes intravenously 
for moderate and severe disease. Methotrexate and azathioprine can be used for milder disease, but extending into that moderate category. Calcineurin inhibitors are immunosuppressive agents that we've borrowed from the transplant physicians. Tacrolimus and cyclosporin are a couple of examples. They've also been used a lot for skin lupus with good benefit. Mycophenolate mofetil is not in green because most of the studies have been doing it for renal lupus or kidney lupus as opposed to for lupus generally, but we know that it can be quite effective and we use it regularly. Benlista is listed here for moderate disease that's refractory to these more traditional therapies, and that's because of its expense. It's not listed for severe disease because it wasn't studied originally for either kidney lupus or for brain lupus, though in general it tends to be used for patients with more frequent flares requiring additional immunosuppression. Cyclophosphamide and rituximab are the other medications that I mentioned as well. On the left are those adjunctive things that I talked about a little bit at the beginning, and those are recognized as being really important. And then on the right are some targets for what we're trying to achieve with our medications for patients. There are some additional specific treatments for manifestations like pericarditis, where there's inflammation of the sac around the heart, which has been shown to respond quite nicely to colchicine. Skin lupus has many topical therapies that can be quite effective, and so protopic would be a good example of that. And then kidney lupus, I already mentioned, tacrolimus and cyclosporine are more frequently used for kidney disease, though we do sometimes use them for skin or joint disease as well. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about lupus in the kidneys because it's such an important part of the lupus disease, and the new medications frequently will target this manifestation. So about 50 to 60% of patients with lupus will have kidney involvement, and we know that's more common in patients who are of Asian, African American, or First Nation background. It's considered a severe or major organ involvement, and treatment usually requires strong immunosuppressive medications. Just like other manifestations, earlier treatment results in better outcomes with less kidney damage and less risk of needing dialysis or kidney transplants. And it's more common to develop lupus nephritis in the first couple of years of disease, and especially within the first five years, but it can occur at any time. So ongoing monitoring with urinalysis lab work is really important to keep close eye on your kidney function and make sure that there's no inflammation there. This is just a little picture to remind you that our kidneys sit in the middle of our abdomen towards the back and they collect urine that goes into the bladder and is excreted. The blood enters the kidneys from the arteries. It's filtered through a collection system, and then the filtered blood returns to the body with waste products excreted. When lupus affects the kidneys, it affects this filtration system, kind of like a sieve that gets gummed up if there's too much inflammatory protein. Most patients with lupus nephritis in North America need a kidney biopsy to assess for the type of inflammation and the severity. We know that more severe infl inflammation is usually treated with high-dose steroids and mycophenolate mofetil or cyclophosphamide as first-line immunosuppressive therapies. If the kidney inflammation doesn't improve quickly enough, there's a risk of scarring or damage, and we know that faster and more complete responses lead to better long-term outcomes. To improve response, sometimes cyclosporine or tacrolimus are added, and sometimes rituximab is used if patients aren't responding or don't tolerate the other medications, even though the clinical trials for rituximab were actually negative. So I've spent all that time talking about lupus in the kidneys. Kind of a third of the new treatments that are available are specifically for lupus nephritis. They're add-on therapies to current treatments. In December of 2020, the FDA approved Benlista or Bilinumab for lupus nephritis. There was a phase three or end-stage uh, trial published in September which showed significant improvement in kidney responses when Benlista was added to standard therapies. So that's approval in the U.S. We're still waiting to hear if Health Canada will approve it for lupus nephritis or if it will be covered by Pharmacare in BC or other funders. I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these. January of 2021, we had another approval which was very exciting for Voclosporin, which is a new medication not already used for other indications, so it might take longer to see if Health Canada also approves it. Albenuchizumab is 
given a breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA, so it's not formally approved for everyone, but there is some access in the U.S., though the complete trials are still ongoing. So benlistat or belimumab isn't really a new therapy. It was originally improved as an IV medication for patients without kidney involvement in 2011, first by the FDA and then by Health Canada. Subsequently, in 2017, the subcutaneous or self-injection form of benlista was shown to be just as effective, and it was approved first in the U.S. and then in Canada. But despite the fact that Health Canada approved benlista, when it went to something called the Common Drug Review, or CADIS, they didn't recommend reimbursement because they were concerned about the cost and about the uncertainty of benefit and which patients in particular would benefit from this medication. And subsequently, none of the provincial formularies have covered the medication, and my access to it for most patients is quite limited. Some patients can access it through their private insurance, but not through the provincial formularies. I am hopeful, and before I start talking about Vocalsporin, that Health Canada will approve Benlista for lupus nephritis, and that we might actually see an approval for lupus nephritis as an indication on the provincial formularies as well, because they do recognize it as being a more severe manifestation with more potential uh, harmful uh, long-term outcomes if not treated aggressively. But time will uh, tell if I'm right. So the second medication I want to talk to you about is also exciting. It's Voclosporin, which they're going to call loop kinase, I think. It was actually developed by a local company in Victoria called Arunia Pharmaceuticals. And they actually came and presented to the Lupus Symposium a couple of years ago with some of their earlier data. It's oral pill, not an injection, which is exciting. But it's also an add-on therapy to our current standard of care. It's a cousin of cyclosporin, so the sporin part at the end is, is on purpose, but it's felt to be better tolerated and safer because it doesn't need to have drug monitoring for levels, which anybody will tell you is, is a challenge for cyclosporin, and it's more effective with higher complete renal responses than the cyclosporin studies. The vocalosporin data is much more rigorous than the cyclosporin data as well. So the same before I move on to abinutuzumab. Um, Vocalosporin has been FDA approved, so they will be marketing it in the U.S. shortly, but it hasn't yet had Health Canada approval, but I'm hopeful that that will come, but it will take some time before it's assessed through the paying system and available through things like Pharmacare. So moving on to the third of the lupus nephritis drugs, abinutuzumab or Gaziva, is actually a medication that's currently approved and has been around for several years to treat blood cancers, particularly CLL and follicular lymphoma. It works in the same way as rituximab, but it's considered a newer generation molecule, so it's more effective. It targets the same part of the immune system that rituximab does. It was shown to be effective in a phase two trial at the American Rheumatology Meeting in November, so we haven't actually seen all of the data published, and their phase three trial is ongoing. It's also intravenous and add-on therapy to standard medication. In the U.S., because of that special designation, they do have some access to start using it already. And in Canada, if we get Health Canada approval, we may be able to use it a bit quicker because it is also available for those other indications. So those are the three medications that are currently almost ready to be used for lupus in the kidneys. But what about the rest of our lupus patients? We also are waiting for news about a new medication called anaphrolimab. It is used for general lupus, not lupus in the kidneys, though they're also doing a kidney study, which is expected to be completed pretty soon. It has a different immune target than any of the other treatments that we have, targeting something called the interferon alpha receptor. There's a couple of phase three trials. The first was negative, but the second was positive, and even the negative trial had some really good trends in their data. So most of the clinicians that were involved in those studies are quite optimistic that it will be successful, but it's currently still being evaluated by the FDA, so we have to wait and see. In particular, it showed really rapid and, and significant improvements for severe skin lupus, and it has been very good for arthritis as well. I worry a little bit that it might be like been listening for Canada with some difficulty in getting coverage through the paying system 
if they're not really clear on, on which patients it should be used in, but hopeful anyways that we will get some access to it. I thought I would t mention a couple of other medications that have had negative trials but haven't really been given up on. So ustekinumab is a medication that we use regularly for psoriasis and for psoriatic arthritis. It had an early positive trial or phase two trial in lupus, and we were quite hopeful that it might be another positive story. But the recent phase three trial was stopped by the company, citing a lack of benefit. They haven't actually published any of that data, so we can't see if there's trends or any other changes to worry about. I think of it still as an option for patients who have both psoriasis and lupus, particularly if the psoriasis is a more severe, because it's most likely to help for that, it's indicated for that, but it likely will help the lupus as well. Another medication is Regeramod or Lupzor, which has been in study for several years. They had a negative phase through trial, but again, it showed some promise and it was very, very safe, well tolerated by most patients. So another phase three trial is planned. And there's also a request to the FDA to market their drug prior to the completion of those trials. But again, we're waiting to hear what the FDA says and certainly no word from any even submissions to Health Canada. I'm nearing the end in case you're tired of all these big words, but I thought it would be exciting to talk a little bit about a non-immunosuppressive therapy. Captopril is a medication that's been used for blood pressure for many years, in fact decades. It's really well tolerated and widely available. There's a group of researchers in New York led by Dr. Betty Diamond who've used brain inflammation models in animals and shown that Captopril actually crosses into the brain and can help decrease brain inflammation and improve the function of the neurons, which is really exciting. It's going to be studied as a potential new treatment for brain involvement in patients with lupus, but I think the clinical trials have been stalled a little bit because of COVID. So it's still very early, but it would be very exciting to have this as a new treatment because it's widely available, it's not immunosuppressive, and it's not expensive. But hopefully that's a story for the next few years coming. If I had a crystal ball and was looking to the future, I've alluded to this already, but I'm hoping along with the new medications, the work that's being done on identifying those specific pathways of the immune system that are not functioning properly will progress, and we'll be able to measure those in patients and, and really target our immune therapies for this specific immune dysregulation for an individual patient. And I'm also hopeful that some of that also basic science will also let us identify inflammation a bit sooner, so better markers than our routine blood work. So just to summarize, there's been quite a lot of excitement in the lupus treatments over the last year or so, with Benlista now being studied and shown to be effective for lupus nephritis, as well as lupus more generally. And hopefully that's going to translate into approval by Health Canada and also by the payers in Canada so that we can have more access to this medication. Because it's been around for 10 years and, and used fairly frequently in the U.S., we know that it's quite safe and well tolerated, which would be helpful. And that in general, patients who do well on it tend to, to do well for quite a long time, so it's got good staying power as well. Vulclosporin is a Canadian success story that's also a new indication for lupus nephritis. Again, we're waiting to hear what Health Canada has to say for that one, but uh, really hopeful that it's going to be approved, and really that should help to improve our speed and the effectiveness of the current therapies and help to keep lupus nephritis under control for more patients. Uh, Benutizumab is a little bit earlier in its study, and I'm hopeful that that's going to be available, but it seems to work really well for patients whose disease is a little more resistant to therapy. Anafrolimab has been around for a long time, and I'm not totally sure what the FDA is going to make of the data that was sort of mixed, but it also seems to be quite safe and well tolerated, so hopefully that will be another medication we can access for general lupus. And then with Regaramod is also in the same boat a little bit earlier, but even better tolerated. I think for both of those medications, really figuring out which patients are going to respond and really targeting our therapies will be a key to successful use for those. That's the end of my planned talk, and I'm 
hoping that all of you will submit questions for the question session at the end. I know that I threw a lot of data out at you in terms of these new medications, which are big words, hoping to leave you with some excitement after waiting 50 years for Ben listed to be approved, and even that was 10 years ago, that we're actually having two medications approved within a month of each other and a couple of more that we expect to be approved over the next year or so is really exciting. Thank you very much and hope to see you at the question session.